Mark chapter 1, verse 21 says this. Then they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he taught there. And they were all astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he began to cry out, saying, Let us alone. What have you come to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. I know that you're the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked that unclean spirit, that devil, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had come out, convulsing, throwing the man on the ground, crying out with a loud voice, then he came out. Then they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, listen to this, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon, also known as Peter, and Andrew, who is his brother, with James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. But Simon's wife's mother, in another word, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, lay sick on the bed with a fever. And they told him, being Jesus, about her at once. So Jesus came, took her by the hand, lifted her up off of her sick bed, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. And I'm almost done. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at Simon Peter's door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Bow your heads and let's pray for just the next couple of seconds. Dear Lord, most loving, gracious, heavenly Father, you begin to speak to me in the nation of Israel concerning this word. God, since then you've spoken to me often about this teaching, this preaching, this first message for me to return here to the assembly. God, everything you've showed me in my heart, I ask that you would do it tonight to glorify your name and God to minister to your people that they would leave here differently and empowered in Jesus' name, I pray. If you would agree with me for that tonight, would you just say amen? I want to speak to all of us tonight on the subject, and this is going to be a simple one, about Jesus Capernaum ministry. Jesus Capernaum ministry. Over the last few days or so that I've been back or we've been back from the nation of Israel, many people, board members, staff members, friends, family members, loved ones, even my grandparents, so to speak, Brooks' grandparents, my grandparents-in-law, if there was such a word, are here tonight to hear about our trip. Of course, if you can't already tell, I'm super eager to tell everybody anything they want to know. But Also, many have said to me that they would love to go. Many have said, I would love to go, but I can't afford it. I would love to go, but I have small kids. I would love to go, but I'm not going to fly in an airplane for 12 hours. And on and on and on. But in the middle of all this, here's what I've heard the most. So many people have come up and they've said, Pastor John, I enjoyed the commentary. I enjoyed not only the pictures of saying, hey, I was here, but then when you would put the scriptures to it and bring it to life and show us what was going on. That's led me tonight to do something. I want to begin this evening with the first message of many messages and just walking back through some of the sites, some of the more memorable sites from my trip. And uh, tonight, if you haven't put it together, I want to start with the Jesus Hometown Ministry Headquarters of Capernaum, all right? So let me just, in place of generally sharing a little uh, uh, scriptural context, tonight, let me share a little geographical insight in case you're not as familiar with the city of Capernaum as I am today currently. And uh, uh, that leads me to just begin to share some of the ministry events of Jesus, some of the ministry feats of 
of Jesus in this one small little town. Obviously, from the text or the passage of Scripture that I've read and shared with you tonight, you already have seen that Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law in this town that the Bible calls Capernaum. Also, you see from the text that I read tonight that Jesus healed many sick people, many who had diseases. He healed many people and drove out many demons. That's very adamant and clear from the text we've read tonight. But let me bring some of those more memorable miracles out that you may have missed happened in the little small town of Capernaum. Yep, you've guessed it. The man, paralytic, who was laying on a mat and couldn't be healed, couldn't get into Jesus, and his friends crawled up on the roof and tore the thatched apart and let him down into the Jesus preaching area. That happened in the little small town of Capernaum. Let me give you another one. Do you remember the account of the man with the withered hand in the synagogue and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees sat on the sidelines seeing if Jesus would heal the man on the Sabbath day? Yeah, that happened in the small city, small town, if you will, of Capernaum. Do you remember Jesus raising Jairus's daughter from the dead? That happened in the city of Capernaum. Did you know that when Jesus was being summoned once he hit the uh, the shores in his boat and he was on his way to Jairus's house that a woman grabbed him with an issue of blood of 12 years and touched the hem of his garment and her bleeding stopped did you know that happened in the city of Capernaum and obviously I could continue to go on and on and tell you about the two blind men healed on the roadside I could tell you about Jesus casting out the deaf and dumb spirit I could tell you about Jesus being questioned about taxes and Jesus selling, telling Peter, just go down to the Sea of Galilee right there on the, the seashore in Capernaum and find a fish with a coin in his mouth. I could also tell you about one of the four messianic miracles that every Jew anticipated for their Messiah to fulfill. No man born of the nation of Israel had ever been healed of leprosy. And when Jesus began to walk out of the town of Capernaum once he was utterly and totally rejected in Capernaum just like he was in Nazareth after three and a half years of a miracle healing crusade ministry there, one man stopped him on the way out, a leopard from his birth, and Jesus fulfilled one of the four great messianic prophecies for the coming Messiah. He healed the Jewish man, a leper from his birth, and as the priest is rejecting him, he said, just go tell the priest. Go show yourself to the priest. Sending one more message to the priest that he really was the Messiah. Knowing that when the leopard went back and says, I was healed, a leper from my birth. This is what you're looking for. And they said, who did it? And he said, Jesus. Jesus hoping and anticipating that that city would have received him and realize that he was the Messiah. Anyways, I could go on and on and on, and there's a tremendous amount of preaching in that, but let me get to where I'm really trying to get this evening. I read a passage of Scripture to us all tonight, Mark chapter 1, very simple passage of Scripture, Mark 1, 21 through 34. And as I read that passage for the very first time there in the nation of Israel, I felt four takeaways, if you will. That's, that's, that's four points, four, four areas to highlight. I felt four takeaways, and tonight I've come home to share those very short four takeaways with our church. You ready? Maybe they'll put number one up on the screen. Here's the first takeaway I want you to write down tonight. I want you to write down our calling. Our calling. And as they're flashing up that first point, our calling, very simple, I'm trusting that they're also ready to throw up the first picture this evening. This is when you begin to take your Holy Land tour this evening. If you would just address your attention to either of the two screens that are up and working, and I've got word from the media department, the third one will be ready by Sunday. Right there, the Sea of Galilee, you'll see one small town nestled in on the northern bank that says Capernaum. You'll also see a town to the east, to your right, that says Bethsaida. 
You'll see Gennesaret and so on and so forth. I went there. I stood there. Many of us did. Here's what I want you to know. Right there in that little bitty town, it's a village, if you will. It's not like Baltimore. It's not like Nashville. It's like the neighborhood you live in right now. Right to the right of it, you can literally see it. Another small village sets there to the east called Bethsaida. Now, that sets me up to share this with you this evening. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew records this, that Jesus calls his first four disciples, Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John, from that little bitty village to the east there, to the right, Bethsaida. Here it is in the scripture. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, and they were casting their nets into the water, for they were fishermen. Now let me give you the second scripture, Matthew 4 and 21. Going on from there, right there in Bethsaida, right they're close to Capernaum. Watch this. Going on from there, he saw two more brothers, James and John, the sons of Thunder, the sons of Zebedee. With their father, they were mending their nets, and he also called them. Here's the reason I'm pointing this out to you this evening. If you back up to Mark chapter 1, verse 21, you actually have the starting place from what I just showed you on the map. Watch this. Then they went into Capernaum. Where are they coming from? The scripture records chronologically, geographically, that Jesus is walking out of Bethsaida, and he walks one little village away over to Capernaum, and he has his first Four disciples following right behind him. I'm going somewhere. Just stay with me this evening. So Jesus, with his first followers in tow, has just obviously, according to the scripture, Matthew 4, 19, told these men, leave your fathers, leave your nets, leave your livelihood, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I'll make you fishers of men. In my humble opinion tonight, before we go any further, after having returned from Israel, I think all of us need to go back to being fishers of men. I think we need to go back to being fishers of men. Here's what I want to point out, giving birth to the title this evening. Did you know that this is a Christian dogma? You say, what's a dogma? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. A dogma is something that we are dogmatic about. We will not move. Even when culture says different, even when society says different, even when organizations say, we are dogmatic about this. And guess what? We've also developed doctrine that through the foolishness of preaching, God will save the loss. God will, God will water the seed. God will cause the seed to grow. We just got to get out there and start planting. We need to be fishers of men. I'm going somewhere. Did you know that nowhere in the scripture were we ever called to be net setting strategist? We were never called to be, we were never called to do what they do on Deadliest Catch, where you see them in there looking at their computer screens, plotting where they will set their nets throughout the barren sea. I want to submit something to you, and I say this kindly and also humbly. Many churches today have become net strategists setting churches and churches today are filling up with net strategists and they are emptying of fishers of men here's my humble opinion we need to be fishers of men we are never called to be net washers we're never even called to be net menders we are called to be fishers of men and while I understand strategy is necessary and washing our nets is necessary and mending our nets is necessary I want to remind all of us here tonight that Jesus Jesus has called us, each of us, to be fishers of men. And we need to be daily, at every turn, at every God-given opportunity, sharing Christ with a lost, hurt, and broken world. We need to be fishing for men and fishing for their soul salvation. Did you know that's our calling? The first thing I took away when I stood in Capernaum and I saw where Jesus called the first four disciples, I heard the voice of the master say, nothing is changed today. You go home, not a net strategy setting man. You don't go home a net cleansing man in a net what? You go home and fish for men. I want to ask you today, how many souls have you seen come to the Lord lately? How many people have you personally led to the Lord? When was the last time any of us actually intimately shared Christ? 
in the plan of salvation. I don't ask that to condemn anybody. I ask that to spur each of us on. I want to share the second takeaway from my time there in Capernaum. It's very simple. Our authority. Our authority. Maybe after you write down number two, our authority, they're going to show another picture on the screen that I'm excited about sharing with you. I want you to literally know I don't have time to show you all of the pictures. Whether you go there in this lifetime or not, I want you to know this is the white synagogue of Capernaum. It was built 150 years after Christ, just like every other synagogue that is found around the Sea of Galilee. Do you know what that means? They had contractors 150 years after Christ lived. They built every synagogue around the lake. They're all the same, identical. But if you were looking at that picture from the left side, you would see a wall that's been excavated through archaeological digs. And what you would see along that wall at the very foundation of the white synagogue built 150 years after Christ, you would see three layers of the foundational stones of the original synagogue that was there that the white synagogue was built upon after the Romans destroyed the original synagogue. The synagogue that Jesus ministered in is that same synagogue. It is literally when you back up and look you see the stones from the synagogue of Mark chapter 1 now go with me here's where I'm going Mark chapter 1 verses 23 through 26 say this Jesus encounters a man in the synagogue of Capernaum with a devil I got a little funny just take this lightly that should remind all of us that there can be and there will be devils up in the church house let me go on because I know that's not going to win no friends tonight we must remember that Jesus has given us power as Christians over all the devilish forces of hell that's my takeaway this is not a Christian dogma. This is a Christian doctrine. Let me show it to you in the scriptures, my friend. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 says this. When Jesus sent out the original 12, he sent them out and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast out the devil, to heal all kinds of sickness, and to heal all kinds of disease. But Jesus didn't stop there. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, he sent out 70. And he said to the 70, when you go out, I'm giving you power over the unclean spirits. I'm giving you power over the devils. But guess what? Your Jesus and my Jesus, he didn't stop there. He came back in Matthew 28 and he said, all authority and all power has been given unto me by my Father in heaven. So now go therefore, cast out the devil, drive out the spirits, heal the diseases, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost until I come again. What are you saying, Pastor John? Here's what I'm saying. Are you ready for this? That the greatest transfer of authority happened in the Great Commission. I, I, I know many of you think the greatest transfer of authority happened when your dad died and he left you an inheritance. I know many of you think the greatest transfer of power happened when you got out of your mom and dad's house. You became 18. You got your first credit card with a $10,000 limit. Man, listen to me tonight. Those things aren't a drop in the bucket. They don't hold a candle to the transfer of authority, the transfer of power that has happened to us in the Great Commission. What are you saying, young preacher? I'm saying this tonight, that we are now devil delivering deputized by Jesus himself and the church better wake up, stand up, rise up in the authority given to us by God in Christ for the authoritative power that God has given us to drive out devils from our church houses, from our houses, from our places of employment, from every relationship. We've been called to this. We've been appointed to this. We've been equipped for this. This is our authority from Jesus. And when I stood in that synagogue, it reminded me that I have the authority to drive the devil out of my life, to drive the devil out of this church, to drive the devil out of my relationships. Let me give you the third one. Our necessity. 
our necessity. Hold your neighbor's hand and say, just hold on. Just hold on. Look straight. Nobody will know he's talking to you. (laughs) The third picture they're going to put on the screens tonight is this. Mr. Robert Warren is here. Miss Dina is here, his wife. They were with us. Miss Sue is here. He helped baptize me in the Jordan River. He stood where I'm standing. If I'm lying, you stand up and call me a charlatan now. I'm standing in the synagogue. All right? This is the white synagogue. Imagine I'm standing in the 150 year past the time of Christ, rebuilt, the foundational stones, you can see them from the side. I'm in the synagogue where Jesus cast out the devil. That reminds me I've been given authority to drive out the devils. I don't have to live with the devil tearing up my life. And I literally turn, and when I turn, this is the view. That's the view. Do you want to know what that is? That is the excavation of the city of Capernaum. It's not like your neighborhood, folks. Everybody ain't got two acres and a 25-square-foot home. The synagogue, you turn, neighborhood. That's one house, two house, three house. It's small. Do you see the modern state-of-the-art building? Do you see that? Do you see it's built up on piers? Do do you see it's not touching the ground? Man, I could go on and on and on and on. There's a law that says you cannot build on top of a historical site in the nation of Israel. But let me tell you what the church did. The church found out that was a holy spot, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Just stay with me. And the church said this spot is so important to us. We're going to pay an architect. We're going to pay the biggest, the brightest, the brightest. We're going to figure out how to build a church over that important spot. It'll never be on it, nation of it. It'll never cover up the dig. And they built that church over Simon Peter's house. Watch this. Found an inscription in the dirt that said home of Simon Peter. All right, let me go to the passage talking about our necessity. In Luke, I'm going to use Luke. I'm going to move away from Mark. Stay with me. In Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 39, here's what you get. Jesus raises Simon Peter's mother-in-law up from the sickbed. Anybody see that? Here, let me give it to you. Luke chapter 4, verses 38 and 39. Now he arose from the synagogue and he entered Simon Peter's house. He's in the synagogue. He's preaching. He's teaching. This is his custom. He heals the man with the unclean spirit. He walks out of the synagogue. He takes 35 steps and he's in Simon Peter's house. You get get what I'm saying? All right. He enters Simon Peter's house, but Simon Peter's mother-in-law lay on a sick bed with a high fever and they made a request of him concerning her. So he stood over her. He rebuked the fever. I'm going somewhere. Remember our necessity. He rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she arose and she served them. You see that? All right. That is the parallel passage from another gospel of Mark chapter 1, verse 29 and 31, the passage that I read to you tonight because I came out of Mark. It's the parallel passage. It says the same thing, two different gospels. Watch this. Funny. This probably won't make me no friends, but maybe it'll lighten the atmosphere. I submit to you tonight that Jesus really didn't like Simon Peter all that much. You say, why, preacher? Because he healed his (laughs) mother-in-law. Let me move on. Once Jesus, once Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law, here's what I want you to see, our necessity. She immediately gets up from her ailment. She gets up from her infirmity. She gets up from her sickness and she begins to serve him. Does anybody see that or am I just dreaming? Once each of us is healed from our infirmities, whatever they may be, division, racism, alcoholism, drug addiction, poverty, when we are healed of our infirmities, the scripture records a dogma that we should rise up and we should begin to serve him. This should be our mindset. 
It should never be said of us what Peter said in the second book, the second chapter, and the 22nd verse. This proverb has become true of many. A dog will return to his vomit like a sow will return to her mire. But Jesus said in Luke 9 and 62, no man having put his hand to the gospel plow and then looking back to what he came out of is fit for the kingdom of God. What are you saying, young preacher, tonight? I'm saying whatever ailment you had before Christ, when he healed you, you need to raise up and immediately begin to serve him. Don't you grow weak. Don't you grow weary. Don't you look back. Never look back. Never let go of the plow. Never return to your mire. Never return to your vomit. So tonight I say I charge the assembly, West Monroe, onward, Christian soldiers. Onward in your great service to the king. Onward, the king is coming. Onward, church tonight. Onward in your necessity. Anybody been brought out of something in this place? Time would fail me to tell you what he brought me out of. I'm not letting go. I'm not looking back. I saw it. I saw where she got up and put her hand to the plow and immediately began to serve him. Pastor Chad, would you please come? 727. I'm moving. I'm moving. Got one last one. You ready? Number four. Number four. Our right. Our right. I write. When you're writing, I write, they're going to put the same picture up for you. Now, the synagogue's right. I mean, there ain't no arguing with the synagogue. Ask Anna McGraw. Ask Leah's, I mean, ask Christopher, Pastor Christopher. There's no arguing with the synagogue. I mean, they find archaeological evidence that that's Simon Peter's house and somebody spent umpteen million dollars on the other side of the world to build a church up off the ground. Somebody believes that's Simon Peter's house. You get my drift? <laughs> We're in the synagogue. This is the little, the little village of Capernaum. See, see the wall back there in the background to the left? Right down that's a big old slope that goes down to a sea called Galilee. It's a freshwater lake. It's beautiful. Jesus was a country boy. Go to Israel and argue with me. He could have been in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv then. He could have been in Jerusalem. Money changers, stores, sandals, clothes. Jesus would go up there one time a year, and then he would go back out in the country. Jesus was a country boy. He walks right out of that synagogue. He walks right into Simon Peter's house. He raises his, he calls his first four disciples. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Don't go back to mending your nets. Don't go back to washing. Don't go back to strategizing how you're going to get rich. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Goes in a synagogue, teaches like somebody they've never heard teach before. This guy's got authority. Starts driving out devils. People say, what kind of new doctrine is this? They reject him. Gets up, walks out, goes to Simon Peter, mother-in-law's house. Simon Peter's house raises his mother-in-law up. She said, I'm not going back.